Vegetarian Cottage, and we're here with Eric Dubé. Yes, this is the moment you've been waiting for. Eric Dubé, author of about half a dozen books, <laughs> Flat Earth Pioneer. Uh, I was a uh, I was reading today that it's been set, it's been written that polls were taken, and there's about uh, two percent of Americans believe in flat Earth, and about seven percent in Brazil. Right. Yeah. So according to my calculations, that comes up to about 15 million in just those two countries. Wow. I just I just was like googling some uh, articles real quick. I heard uh, one article is up to six percent. Yeah. So I don't know how they some, figured these there's things some out, but three or four percent that are uncertain. So I mean, for Google search results, there's tens of millions. <laughs> yeah. And then if my channels, if you don't if like, if you uh, count them all together, I've got like 40 million. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's just me and then everybody else that mirrors videos and makes flat earth videos there's got to be you know, tens of millions hundreds of millions of views anyway mm -hmm. tens of millions in just a few, you know a few short years so when people are getting discouraged or saying that it's stagnating that's, yeah. that seems to be the latest mm -hmm. thing as people are saying that mm -hmm. i feel like the flat earth is stagnating <laughs> you heard that one? It's just not yeah. going anywhere yeah. really there's no hope man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can, you know convincing uh, tens of millions of people in the space of a few short years that like everything they've been taught since they were <laughs> children is a complete lie and having them you know, get through it. I think, I think there's a lot to be happy about. Before you came on the scene with your research, do you know how many like Google hits or what was the statistics of how, much, how many people were actually looking into Flat Earth at the time? Yeah, there was there was just a couple hundred <laughs> on Google, yeah, and it was mostly Flat Earth Society and their forum and their right. pages, which is nothing you know to speak of other than their links that they had to the old Flat Earth books, the 1800s books. Those were good. That was about all I could find. That's why that's yeah. what's included in my books is because that's what was available when I researched the subject. Um, so now it's but in the past five years just exploded. So mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. There's a lot to be happy about the it beat out Donald Trump and the Kardashians and a bunch of other like top keywords so it's it's going strong and the, the stagnation I think people are expecting like the next step is that people are going to come out on the news and the mainstream media <laughs> astronauts are going to be like oops I was just faking and then they're going to do lecture circuits you know like David Icke nine hour lectures exposing NASA or something like that. I think what people like they're going to surrender yeah yeah that's what people I think are expecting yeah. is some sort of mass surrender or, or some sort of mass event that if you think about it that's not going to happen. The mainstream doesn't allow that kind of thing to happen. The news media doesn't want to give that kind of coverage to anybody, but Mark Sargent is just going to, you know, give us the worst flat earth, you know, explanations ever to turn people off. So, uh, I think the problem is more in the expectations that we're expecting too much, but not even too much, because I mean, we've, we've exceeded my expectations in many ways. And it's just going to continue, you know, it's, mm -hmm. as I say, once you go flat, there's no going back. <laughs> Unless, of course, you're uh, Tiger Dan or Seek Truth, Speak Truth, <laughs> oh, or any of these other guys that are pretending clearly to be Flat Earthers first to gain street cred in well, well, the Flat Earth community. You're brainwashing me with the way you're talking, man. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's the I've been drowning on my monotone <laughs> cadence that just hypnotizes people and makes yeah. them believe the Earth yeah. is flat. You brainwashed me into thinking, knowing that the obvious is true. <laughs> it's amazing how my voice just does that, but I hear about it every day in the comment section. Uh, just people are hypnotized. And then, you know, thanks to like, Fight the Flat Earth and Simon Dan and whatever else these weirdos come up with, they, they just convince people right back that, you know, I'm a con man and, you know, they were hypnotized with all my, you know, magic, yeah. my word, they, they my word right. magic. They're still busy. They we're in, right in the middle of the counterattack now with the censorship. Uh, yeah, I heard like about a year ago, Google took down their. That uh, that line to not be evil from their code of conduct. Not that we get, they want to get sued for <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> false advertising. Have you also noticed the increase in uh, NASA T-shirts that people are wearing that are that are adorning uh, markets and stores? I was about to bring that up when you <laughs> oh, yeah. said about how it's like 
the damage control is just in overdrive. One of the main things I noticed is the NASA shirts, they're everywhere. It's like they must have influxed the market with like really cheap NASA shirts. Because it's not like people buying NASA shirts from NASA.gov or yeah. something. They definitely are flooding the Walmarts or the thrift stores or yeah. something. The cheap NASA shirts and these people that don't give a shit about NASA one way or the other are rocking NASA shirts. Oh, yeah, NASA's now. cool. Space yeah. is cool. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. outer space campaign, <laughs> the marketing campaign. Space is Force. Awesome. That's the new one for this year. <laughs> yeah. Space Force. That sounds cool. Space, space Force. Yeah. Yeah. It's like sure. a... <laughs> Buy the t-shirt. Yeah, be a space marine. Mm. Until in the last, uh, I would say the last year, I've noticed that no more than a year. Ago. Yeah, mm, yeah. Right? It's been a once in a great while you'd see a NASA shirt back in the day. Well, I never, I've never seen one. Really? Yeah, just until recently. Yeah. And the, when you saw it back in the day, it was a real fanboy that got it because he's into I NASA. Yeah. Nowadays, yeah, just yeah, right. people that have nothing, they don't care about NASA. You can tell because they see like the people walking the streets here in Thailand. And they, they probably have no idea what NASA Who's is. Who would be a fanboy of NASA? I mean, atheists. <laughs> <laughs> Evolutionists. Trekkies. Trekkies. Star Wars mm -hmm. fans. People okay. that want to believe that there's better places out there in the universe somewhere as long as our technology mm -hmm. can bring us there one day. <laughs> So it doesn't matter if we trash this place. <laughs> we have to terraform the other fabled uh, CGI yep. space balls out there. That's right. <laughs> That's one thing. In your uh, research, you kind of point out that there's no real evidence that any of those lights in the skies are actually three-dimensional solid terra firma spheres. Right. What we call planets. Mm -hmm. uh, we're used to be called wandering stars and if you look at them through a telescope they look just like a regular star and they're mm -hmm. only different based on mm -hmm. the, the wandering paths that they mm -hmm. they seem to, to make because they're revolving around the Sun as the Sun revolves around us so it makes kind of a spirograph pattern and that results in retrograde motion every once in a while and, and so all these things have explanations in the flat earth geocentric cosmology that people have been, oh retrograde motion that that ruins your flat earth doesn't it it's like what are you even talking about yeah. these things were already well explained long before the globe earth ever came into play anyway mm -hmm. people have been taught that there isn't explanations for things that there are perfectly good explanations for mm -hmm. or they've been taught straw man mm -hmm. wrong explanations by you know controlled opposition mm -hmm. people like the flat earth society telling them that the Earth disk is constantly rising or something to account for gravity. So to this day, it still comes up as the top pages from pretty much any Flat Earth search you make on Google. You're going to get some page from the Flat Earth Society or from their forum that gives all this disinformation. And as you're, you know, genuinely looking into Flat Earth for the first time, this is what you're going to see. And it's going to seem ridiculous, just, just like you thought it would be. And so you confirmed your bias and you're even more sure that there's no friggin' way the Earth is flat and these people are friggin' retards like I thought they were. And that's, that's how it works. It's g genius. They're doubling down on that strategy too with yeah. the, the, the new campaign now with like Mad Mike, the guy who launches rocket. Right? Yeah. So <laughs> he, he doesn't even go as high as an airplane does. Exactly. Right? Yeah. He's going to find out whether the earth is flat by going. He's mad. <laughs> right. Or BOB is launching a satellite to, to prove that the earth is flat, even though satellites aren't supposed to be real. But and he's a millionaire and he's got like a million dollar campaign to, to launch it. Mm. Or they're just general like flat earthers that wear weird clothes. They're really eccentric, you know. Mm -hmm. all the, all <laughs> they're apparently the, like the conspiracy researchers. <laughs> the people that sell stuff at the flat earth conferences. <laughs> yeah. Or like Nathan Thompson with his ball earth helmet hat thing that he <laughs> prances around I wearing. I really saw it. <laughs> I just you know what I'm talking about. I think I remember some a image of that he wears like a little helmet hat with glasses and like. <laughs> Cool man. Cool. Oh yeah, he kicked me out of his group because uh, why? I don't even know why. I think, I think it was because of uh, calling Mark and Patricia Shields. You can't call Mark and Patricia Shields in the official flat Earth discussion. Why are you being so negative on man? Facebook? I know I'm being divisive. You know, if I notice things, you know, if I notice lies and disinformation and talk about it. That's being divisive. And right. We're all supposed to be on the same team here, yeah, right? <laughs> Even liars and disinformants. We're all together, man. <laughs> I've heard you say that you never really bought like the, the spinning ball uh, reality. But when you were early on in your research, what was like your eureka moment? I never fully bought it. Mm -hmm. I still 
assumed it was <laughs> correct. I mean, I had my initial yeah. questions right when it was taught to me as, mm -hmm. as a child, and the questions weren't satisfactorily answered, and I never thought they were. But nobody else was making those observations or those critiques, so I just kind of put it away for a while. Mm -hmm. I remember one, one time I was researching it at Chula, where I used to work on a break time during when I was teaching at university, and I was researching Peter centrism. Um, and somebody came over to the librarian there, and I just started telling him some facts about geocentric universe and how the whole heliocentric spinning thing, how it just doesn't work because of the star trail, star trail rotation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he sat there and listened to the whole thing, and by the end of it, he's just like, I don't know about you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. <laughs> it was like my first experience with trying to... At that point, I wasn't even into Flat Earth yet, because yeah. I was into geocentrism right. first. The idea that, okay, the Earth's a ball, but it surely doesn't seem to be moving. So it was kind of like my easing my way into it. And there was a little bit more information on that, factual information on that, outside of the Flat Earth Society that I could mm -hmm. find online. Stuff about the Mickelson-Morley, Mickelson-Gale, mm -hmm. Sagnac, Airy experiments. So there's actual scientific experiments that have been done to show that the Earth isn't moving. And you can do them yourself just by looking up at the sky, because mm -hmm. if the Earth was spinning around the Sun, which is spinning around the galaxy, which is shooting off through the universe, mm -hmm. there's four different motions that are all happening all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it would be impossible for there to be constellations ever, because no two nights would be the same. And star trails wouldn't be perfect circles, they would just be irregular spiral shapes, just completely random all the time, if the Earth was actually undergoing all the motions that the heliocentric system says we are. So that was my first exploration into it, and you know, it was received just, just as the flat Earth was received with complete incredulity and Little. thinking I'm ridiculous. Yeah. You're a little special, I think, Eric. Why do you question, you know, uh, consensus truths? But even the, uh, you know, who do you think you are? All right, how dare you? How dare you? You think your first you grade teacher smart? is lying? Every scientist, every teacher, everybody—they're all in on it. Millions of people. Yep, they are willingly so lying about it. You're anti-science. <laughs> yeah, it's anti-science too. Yeah. Right. No. <laughs> Most yeah, people like, just go along to get along. It's not the same as the same science that goes into, let's say, building an engine. <laughs> it's not the right. same at all. It's theoretical science. <laughs> theoretical phys physics and yeah. astrophysics and all these things. These are not things that are... You can't prove that a black hole exists to me here. You but know, there, there's a movie about it now. Interstellar. And that's all the proof most people need. <laughs> he worked... I saw they went to Christopher the Christopher Nolan worked it was with on NASA, video. man, for the visual effects. Yeah, man. If it's on video, it's real, don't you know? And questioning it is stupid. Yeah. So you're saying, like, modern-day astronomy and the star maps, the distance of galaxies and stars, that is fiction. No. You're saying that. Yeah. I'm saying that. You're yeah. saying it's like <laughs> you're Einstein saying that. and Newton and the geniuses <laughs> of past generations. <laughs> Are, you're smarter than all of them. Decades of science. <laughs> I mean, there's like a. Imagine how many Star Wars expanded universe novels there are. You're telling me that's all fiction? <laughs> how much work went into that? All for nothing. <laughs> when people say, what does it matter? Right. But that's the one that just. Mm. As if. if the entire world has been successfully lied to yeah. about what the world is, where we are, for 500 years. And if that was true, I don't even see how that's important. Yeah. How's that relevant? <laughs> what is it? Yeah. My place in, in the universe, a yeah. single verse <laughs> of this reality that I know and what it all means, the mystery of life. What's it, why does it even matter? <laughs> okay, it's you still gotta go to work in the morning. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a defense mechanism. To be, we've talked about this before. When people say, what does it even matter? I think it's they're trying to convince themselves that it's not important by saying that because they know it's absolutely important if true but they don't want to accept that it could possibly be true so they want to be like it's even if it was true it's not important right 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 give me a reason you know convince me otherwise and if you don't then it's not important yeah 
and then the onus is now suddenly on you, the crazy flat earther, to convince somebody who's done no research why this thing is true and important to their life when they say, well, I still have to get up and work in the morning, so it's even a matter of the earth is far. Yeah, they're just all like, so, <laughs> what causes the eclipses? Answer me now. <laughs> That's it, and they'll just start asking you questions. Like, asking a question is a defense. Like, like that's somehow giving evidence to the contrary if they say, well, how do you explain this then? Yeah. It doesn't matter how I explain this then. You, you, that's not a, uh, an argument. Yeah. You're just shifting the onus onto me again. And then, you know, no matter what I say, you'll just dismiss it because you haven't done any research. And, you know, but that's, that's the tactics. That's the yeah. rhetoric. That's why people are so discouraged from trying to wake people up and then having this happen. And then they feel like the flat earth is stagnating because they're stagnant and the, the methods that they're using and the people who are around them are stagnant mm -hmm. but I mean the flat earth I mean it's, it's been here yeah. long before Eric Dubé or anyone else uh, so it's not stagnating it's, it's humanity that's stagnated and it has nothing to do with the flat mm -hmm. earth it has to do with the actual consciousness of the people we're trying to wake up but it's so far gone there's plenty to be positive for it absolutely mm -hmm. is developing but if you want to say what's stagnating it's not the yeah. flat earth it's the sheep yeah. it's the people it's these, yeah. the people that are left to wake up now are the people that didn't wake up in the past five years. These are the people who have gone through it all and they're still like, no, I'm, I don't think that, I'm not even going to look into it. What is, why does it even matter? So these are the hardest people to wake up and so that's why it feels stagnant. I just saw this one video, it wasn't even one of yours, it was just one video that showed the high altitude balloon footage and the sunspot. Mm. Yep. And you don't see any motion and then it was like, I was like, could it be? Could it be? And then I got to your videos and the thing that really hit me hard was your explanation of circumnavigating the flat plane mm -hmm. of the Earth as opposed to going around the Earth. Right. And that took me a while to figure out. I finally understood it as I broke through that programming, that globe programming. Then I was like, oh my God. Because we're told mm -hmm. that circumnavigation on a ball mm -hmm. goes in a straight line. Mm -hmm. And by just traveling in a straight line somehow, we go all the way around and come back to our same location. Mm -hmm. But in reality, anybody that's ever done circumnavigation, first of all, they don't do north to south, they only do east to west. And when they have done it, whether it's Magellan uh, back in the 1500s or it's people nowadays in airplanes, they just go from port to port, seaport to seaport or airport to airport in relatively straight lines. And they're not, not a completely straight line, they're going from here to here to here, if it was a ball, then they come around. But on the flat earth, they're just going, you know, from port to port to port until they eventually make a circle and come back around to where they mm -hmm. were. So nobody is actually going in a straight, completely straight line, never deviating left or right, and then coming back to where they started from. That's just mm -hmm. a false claim that we're taught as children, mm -hmm. and people still think it's true, even though mm -hmm. it's never happened. No circumnavigation like that has mm -hmm. ever happened. And we're taught that east and west are like straight lines. Mm -hmm. North is up, south is down. The reality is, is that north is the center point. North is where all the compasses point to the North Pole. Polaris is directly above it, the only unmoving star in the heavens. Everything else revolves perfectly around that point. And then south is every line tangent to it. The entire perimeter is the south point. And then east and west aren't straight lines, but circles going around either way. So the sun, moon, and stars still rotate east to west, but in circles east to west over and around the flat earth. And when we circumnavigate, we can still circumnavigate west to east, east to west, but it's going in a circle from port to port, not traveling in a completely straight line, never deviating, and then suddenly coming back yeah. to where you started, as we're told happens. Yeah. You just got the North Pole, and if you're going east or west, you're going, they would just go around it. Like the needle of the compass would always like yeah. adjust as you go around the North Pole. Yeah. I, I always thought that was funny about how compasses work and how you got to hold it parallel to the ground. Yeah, <laughs> too. You have to hold it flat. <laughs> so like, and the, the needle's pointing to the north or it doesn't really point to the south mm -hmm. unless you bury the needle down. Right. <laughs> Imagine if you were standing on the south pole <laughs> of a ball of earth with your compass upside down holding it flat and it's supposedly pointing north which is up here, <laughs> yeah. north, but it's pointing out here into outer space under the ball. How could a compass work at the south pole on a ball? It makes no sense. Yeah. It makes you wonder what that magnetic source that is attracting that compass needle. Yeah, what is it actually? What does it look like? Yeah, because it's Someone certainly knows. not some <laughs> molten metal constantly moving in the middle mm -hmm. of a ball that causes mm -hmm. a constantly moving mm -hmm. north and south dipole. Like, 
with that. You talk about this, uh, the legend of Mount Meru in some of your videos. That is quite the, there's some people that are really uh, enchanted by that. Mm. Calling it paradise must be there. Mm. Especially with the 24 hour sunlight that's around that area. The northern lights too are kind of uh, in curious, yeah. a curiosity Another of that area. <laughs> phenomenon in the north. Yeah. They say we've attained the pole and there isn't a big mountain of magnetite there. It's just ice. <laughs> it's just ice, sometimes it's water, constantly shifting. <laughs> and they never show video of like Polaris being 90 degrees above. Mm -hmm. They never show, you know, sextant measurements or anything, so we can prove that they're definitely at the North Pole. Mm -hmm. They just show 90 degrees on a Garmin, on the GPS, and some, some <laughs> yeah. ice plateau somewhere. Um, and the other thing is that the, the the heavens from there they're completely unique. It's supposed to be that Polaris is directly overhead, 90 mm -hmm. degrees. All the other stars would move around you horizontally and seem equidistant away from you, and then the sun. There's like six month days and nights supposedly at the North Pole. But you're never going to find a single video of this online. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So the sun goes up. If you, if you are a, an observer at the North Pole, you shouldn't see the sun for about some, several months. And then you start to see the first rays of it. And so at dawn will just start to go around you every 24 hours. And then you'll start to see the head of the sun. And it'll start to blur out some of the stars mm -hmm. until it comes up. And then you see the whole sun. And then summer lasts for, you know, one day lasts for several months mm -hmm. and it'll go up as far as 23.5 degrees on the horizon. That'll be the summer solstice for somebody at the North Pole. Mm -hmm. And then it will start to go down mm -hmm. until the autumn equinox. And then it's going to start the long night, the long winter, and the sun will disappear. And, mm -hmm. it'll, and like dust will last for like 45 days to 60 mm -hmm. days. So here at dusk lasts like 45 minutes. Yeah. So up there it's a whole different thing. And then you know, the, the sun will completely disappear and you will see the entire northern dome of the heavens circling horizontally perfectly around you as the observer unimpeded for months by sunlight. You know, usually you can only see star trails for 12 hours at a time or so. Mm -hmm. Here you'll be able to see them for months unchanging, you know, going around. And, you know, you'd think that would be worthy of like an IMAX <laughs> documentary, that would be worthy of being Just imagine what kind of plant prime time grow, channel grows there under those like unique conditions. <laughs> yeah, I, I, sure, yeah. it's, it's supposedly very temperate, and they, they say that it's you know, ice and, and all this mm -hmm. all the time. But you know, I'm skeptical. Just a sad, lonely polar bear. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> somewhere. A couple seals <laughs> beating it down. Yeah, I'm, I'm skeptical. Because um, there is there's, there's no video of that. I'd love to see that. Wouldn't you love to see an IMAX video of the polar astronomy that I just described? Yeah. You'd think that would be absolutely like a wonder of the world. But no, you can't even find a single video online or anywhere else yeah. showing that. That's but supposedly, away. Well, you can take like penguin tours there, just like the South Pole, allegedly. One of the things that I find uh, empowering about your research is that you tell people that to trust their own senses and their own reasoning skills, their own observations to figure things out for themselves instead of handing the authority over to someone else. They can take the authority themselves and figure it out to just see the obvious things and to use your senses like uh, how the horizon always rises to high level no matter how high you get. We're up on the Bayok 2 Sky Tower in Bangkok and it is the tallest building in Bangkok. 84 stories high, so we're about a thousand feet up, which with a curvature calculator says the horizon is about 37 miles away from us. So if we're looking out 37 miles that way, is about 37 miles the other way. We're talking 72 miles, and we're up a thousand feet. And after 37 miles, there should be a thousand feet of curvature. So the horizon should be 2,000 feet below us, technically, but it's right at eye level, just like it will always be, regardless of how high you are. If you're up on Mount Everest, it's still at eye level. If you're up in an airplane at 35,000 feet, it's still at eye level. And if you're taking a high altitude balloon as high as it goes, 120,000 feet is still at your eye level, proving that you're over a flat plane. Because if you are over a ball, no matter how big the ball was, the horizon is the curvature of the ball. So it cannot rise up to your eye level. 
So we should have to look down right now to be able to see the horizon. If you're in an airplane, you should have to look down even more to be able to see the horizon. And if you are looking at those high altitude balloon footage, which are four times higher than commercial planes fly, it's still right at the eye level. But if the Earth was a ball, even if the ball was a hundred times bigger than they say it is, it's below you. You have to tilt your neck down, you have to look down to see it, but you'll never do that on the Earth because the Earth's not a ball, as you can see. And we know for sure in the Flat Earth community there's controlled opposition, so I wouldn't be surprised at all if they started doing some sort of false flag type things to associate Flat Earthers with dangerous or criminal activities. Mm -hmm. At this point, they've already associated us with just being retarded with like, <laughs> Flat Earth conferences and, and the Flat Earth Society and all that stuff. But if that doesn't work, they may you know, try to go to the next level and be like, no, they're actually dangerous criminals. They call me yeah. a con man, a plagiarist. They, they have a bunch of titles. Get people want. killed over here. Yeah, you know, <laughs> trying to prove the Earth is flat. Okay. Yeah. There were some other kind of false flag to make flat earthers look, look bad or look dangerous. Like they've done with beacons. I think there's definitely been some yeah, yeah, exactly. beacon like false beacon flags thing. where they, they send in Asian provocateurs to make beacons look even more annoying than we really are. <laughs> like, like I know we're a little annoying. We're not that annoying, I guarantee. Yeah. Yeah, like um, they're ripping someone's fur coat off in the middle yeah, of the yeah, restaurant. Yeah, the fur coats, that kind of thing to me, that's yeah, yeah. taking it too far. Uh, that's not productive. So. Um, and the people doing some of that could certainly be controlled opposition. Yeah. If you have satellites, why do you need about 550,000 miles of undersea fiber optic cables to connect the, the world's internet? <laughs> why, why, do, uh, why do satellites still attach to balloons keep, keep falling everywhere? Yeah, the, the only satellites that actually exist are, are not floating up there in you know, yeah. vacuum space, as they tell us. They're just weather balloons. Just yeah. like we know, and they got the, solar panels on them. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> and like you said, 99% of all communication is done through ground towers and undersea cables, so there's no need for them anyway. And before satellites, they had uh, military systems like uh, was like DECA and LORAN, they were called, and those were able to get all the way around the world, no problem. So there's actually no need to have these fantastic devices floating up there in space to send us pictures or to relay weather information or anything. It's just another story we've been told, like the moon landing, and we all assume it must be true because some authority said so. They said we went there, I saw a picture of it, so it's true. And that's the level of proof that people require nowadays. And when you try to get something that is empirical, objective, that you can actually be tangible, that you can figure out for yourself, then people say that you're like, you know, some crazy conspiracy theorist because you want to be able to test things for yourself. And we just have to rely on the scientists and the authority figures. And if you don't, you're, you're dumb somehow. Do you know how many space agencies there are in the world? No. I think it's like a couple thousand. No. Yeah, I think so. And our, I think a dozen of them are able to have like rockets. I mean, they have rockets, right? Yeah. So I think, well, <laughs> what would your like flat Earth defense be on that? Too. Well, it's not just NASA, right? It's all the other people. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Other yeah. people lie too. It's not just NASA. Yeah. Uh, other countries want to scam their populations out of tax money too, and not just Americans. Yeah. Go figure. Yeah. They're like outer space theme parks. Right. <laughs> you go there with your family. Outer space is a theme park. Pose for some pictures with like some astronaut mannequins or some like space outer space paraphernalia, mm -hmm. like uh, like movie props. Right. <laughs> they promote it to kids and stuff. And right? If those like theme parks make enough money, and then eventually, okay, now we can get rockets included now. <laughs> well, put on that little those theatrics of uh, rockets taking off. That's all it Smashing is. Smashing into the Bermuda Triangle. Right. That's what happens, certainly. That's what the Bermuda Triangle is. It's just the area in which uh, Fort Lauderdale rockets <laughs> fall yeah. back to the ocean. Yeah, for sure. Because you can see all rockets, they don't just go straight up like yeah. they should if they're going into outer space. They do a, a big parabola, and then when they get to about this point, they fall out of your 
perspective, <laughs> so you can't see anymore. And then the authorities explain to you that, oh, it's fall, it's using gravity to fall around the curve of the Earth, and then it's going to be whipped around by gravity <laughs> yeah. and send a trajectory. So they actually say it has to be done just right to get a trajectory perfectly to the moon or wherever you it is. Sling going. Going. Slingshot past the sun, right? right. <laughs> it's kind of funny, too, how they used to tell that pretty man story about don't go to Bermuda Triangle because, yeah. you know, ships have gotten. Did you, have you ever read that? Yeah, yeah. Did you know that there's a. Sucked, like sucked into yeah, some yeah. strange dimension. The first Bermuda Triangle disappearance story came in 1950, the same year that uh, the first <laughs> rocket was shot up from, from Florida. So you're telling me that the Bermuda Triangle has nothing to do with a fire crystal of Atlantis that exploded or something? Sea monsters. <laughs> and the Both of us giant involved. <laughs> No, it's just people who see what they're not supposed to see regarding NASA's rockets that they shoot into the ocean right in that yeah, vicinity. Exactly. And yeah. the way you're asking about the other countries, it's the same thing. Yeah. It's, it's a tax scam. So mm -hmm. NASA, for instance, makes $52 million a day from American taxpayer money just to give us CGI photos and shoot those rockets up. It makes some good movies say, that why would they go to all, why would they spend all that money to fake it? They're not getting it, hello. Yeah, it's a, they are getting that much money every day to fake it. They're not spending nearly that much money every day to do it. So they're running to the bank with American taxpayer and other countries' taxpayers' money and spending pitifully little of it to fake us into believing it. And the rest is, you know, laughing to the bank. Yeah, but if it doesn't matter that they're doing this, then... Oh, matter, yeah, it doesn't even know, matter, because like I have to go to work yeah. in the morning. Yeah. So shut up, you crazy yeah. flatter. <laughs> Eric, this is awesome. Um, when did you discover this place? Uh, it's been quite a few years yeah? since I've been coming here. For oh, really? Years. Yeah, it's one of the first vegetarian places I found in Bangkok. But it looks like everything's vegan, almost. Yeah, most of it's vegan. There's yeah. a few, like, they put cheese in certain things, so oh, they have some... You know, vegetarian introductory options for people that aren't all the way over there yet. Awesome. The, uh, the woman that runs the place, I think her mom died of cancer like 20 years ago or something, and, and opening these restaurants and making these mock meats and stuff was kind of her way of trying to give back, you know, it's because she, she found out about how, you know, cancer can be cured by this kind of thing, and her mom was never able to, to do so, so now this is kind of like a legacy. Type. When did you um, become vegan? About, I was a slow transition. It started about 11 years ago, probably within the first year or two I transitioned all the way. How many yeah. times did you go back and forth? Like, did you cheat and stuff? A little bit. I, I mainly tried to wean myself off a meat, a meat at a time, right. starting with like beef and then pork and then chicken right. and then uh, other seafood besides fish and then fish and then went on to the eggs and milk and ice cream and all that kind of stuff. Right. Actually, yeah. Did you have a moment where you had already gone completely vegan and then you caved in? Not cave. I don't know, I wouldn't call it cave, but there's been little things that, you know, something you want to eat and you find out there's something in it. Oh, that's different. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know that, that, that counts. That, yeah. No, that, that doesn't count at all. Or, or there's no real options and you yeah. find out that, you know, yeah, like you won't bread was like, made punish yourself. Like some people are gonna be like, oh, I'm so depressed because I did that. But um, so, what came first, your veganism or your unbelievable ability to um, do crazy things with your body? <laughs> oh, like yoga and yeah. martial arts. And stuff. <laughs> that all came first, actually. That came first. Yeah. Um, I started doing martial arts at 15 and yoga shortly after that. Uh, and at that point, I was just eating crap. Oh, really? <laughs> Standard American diet. Uh, eating many meals a day, trying to weight lift and bulk up, oh, beefy yeah. and stuff. Ended up making myself sick, just eating a bunch oh. of crap. Gave myself tonsillitis. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. I ended up about oh, mid 20s. I was probably 24, 25 when I started researching vegetable health in general. Mm -hmm. so I started by like getting rid of soda and coffee mm -hmm. and cigarettes. I used to, used to do all that. So cut out those first, and then started looking at. Food and yeah. found out the, the foods I should be cutting out and, and adding and it's pretty easy. The foods you should cut out are those that come from animals right. and the foods you should add is all the stuff that is plants. Yeah. <laughs> it's and real it's simple. It's the healthiest thing, the most ethical thing and the most environmentally friendly right. way you can possibly eat. 
So it's the trifecta of perfection of how we should be eating, yet we're told a bunch of these myths about how we need protein or, mm. you know, plants have feelings too. <laughs> <laughs> or that uh, you can love animals and eat them at the same time. You know, all these myths that we believe that really yeah. aren't true. Wow. Well, did you... Um did you notice that your skills got better after, or was it were you already that far? I mean, far maybe advanced? not my skills, but uh, my energy levels, your energy and level. that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I have definitely my energy levels have increased with the, the plant-based diet, and I don't have to sleep as much. And, um, recovery time doesn't take as long in between mm. workouts. Um, there's a lot of benefits. There's right. only benefits, honestly, on every parameter. I can't think of anything that animal products, you know, are yeah. better for me or for anything. It's, it's win, win, win. Or as Doug Graham says, winfinity. Oh, I don't know that one. Winfinity. Okay. <laughs> Should I get a t-shirt that says that? <laughs> Do you think that being living in Thailand has made it easier to uh, be vegan? Here also in the big city, Bangkok is getting more and more vegan friendly as time goes on. It's incredible. So yeah. I think it is pretty easy comparatively speaking here. But as long as you put a little effort into planning your meals and getting everything ready and knowing where the vegan options are in your area, it's really not as big of a lifestyle change as people make it out to be. I know a lot of people that say that they don't have the time or the money, you know, they're busy so they can't go with it, you know, prepare meals and stuff. The reality is though that it's only the transitionary period where you have to think about that stuff. After a few weeks or a month of eating that way, it takes you no more time, no yeah. more money, no more extra effort or thinking involved. You just shift over the things that you used to eat to new things, and it's. it's it can be cheaper. Actually. It can be cheaper. It just depends on how spoiled you are. You know, like if you're just thinking about like how the animals are not suffering, then it, you can make it as cheap as as you need to make it. Right? Yeah, the, the cheapest foods yeah. are plant foods. You exactly. Know, rice and you know, beans right. and stuff like Beans. That. Yeah. yeah, it just depends on like, I mean, yeah, sure, we're here at this amazing place that's making all this amazing mock meat, but you don't have to do that. This is just a special treat. Right. And, uh, I think, like, and nobody stops eating these kind of foods yeah. because we don't like the way they taste. Mm -hmm. So when people are like, well, if you're vegan, why do you have to eat these mock meats? Well. I didn't stop eating meat because it tasted bad. Yeah. We, we like these tastes. Yeah. I, it wasn't the meat that tasted yeah, good yeah, anyway. That's, it was that's the, the stuff, secret, isn't yeah. it? It's not it's the meat the that actually that tastes good. It's everything yeah. that you, yeah. you've, uh, you know, it's the spices and exactly. the herbs and everything else that goes on it. Because yeah. if you just eat a piece of raw, unseasoned meat, no. it's disgusting. Like, the smell of smoke coming off the grill is horrible. It's, yeah. it's not an appetizing thing at all. Mm -hmm. The thing that's appetizing is a barbecue sauce and everything mm -hmm. else you put on it, exactly. which is all vegan. Yeah, yeah, like when I was a little kid, if I was given a piece, I remember getting a piece of steak somewhere and it was not seasoned and yeah. I was chewing forever and I just thought, oh God, and I, it gave me time to think of, that it was an animal that I was eating. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Eric, thank you once more for bringing us here. Thanks for talking to us. Um, that was, that was great. You're very welcome. Well, um, thanks for coming. It's been a pleasure to hang out with you guys uh, here. Likewise, likewise. Okay. The well, sun it. is setting upon the rest oh, of the Oh, jeez. <laughs>